Hey everybody, Simsar here. Welcome back to the channel. So today's video is a rough cut from last week's New York Best Conference. This is a conference about battery technology and energy storage. Uh, so this speech is the keynote from that conference. It uh, features Dr. Stanley Whittingham, a Nobel laureate who is famed for the creation of the lithium ion battery. My apologies in advance for the quality of this video. The uh, feed from the Zoom was pretty low. Additionally, during the Q&A session at the end, there's no microphone, so unfortunately we can't hear the questions. Regardless, I hope anybody who's interested in battery technologies or battery metal investing finds this content interesting. If I happen to get a higher resolution copy from the conference coordinators, I'll see if I can post that up later. All right, here we go. Our first speaker of the day is Stan Whittingham, winner of the 2019 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the invention of the lithium ion battery. Stan is an incredibly unique individual. In addition to winning the Nobel Prize and continuing to contribute uh, to battery uh, technology over his very long career, he is a really active board member for New York Best. He was a founding board member for New York Best. He remains our uh, vice chair for research. Stan has not rested on his laurels or for winning the Nobel Prize. He has worked very hard to advance battery chemistry, to advance the battery industry, and to advance it here in New York State and to help New York State be a leader in this area. So I want to personally thank Stan and welcome Stan to the stage. Thank you very much, Bill, for those kind words. What I want to do is um, really give you a little bit of background bit. So this is the incubator. So if you walk down the street, you won't be able to miss it. It's probably the only modern building on that street, I think. And this is the level of activity they have. It's amazing the number of companies that have joined. And you can look at the numbers yourself, so I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, they have very active programs, a lot of members and more and more coming on each day. This is sponsored by NYSERDA. They approve the membership, so you can see there are more members than approved members, but that's growing each day. What we do have available, if you've got, um, if you're from a startup company or know of one who wants to have one of your young, younger folks supported, they can come to the university, we'll pay them a reasonable salary and they can work with us and get that company going. And again, I think Pear is somewhere in the audience at the back. So grab hold of him or go to their table. There's a table right next to our next East table and they can explain what this Empower program's all about. So what I want to do in my technical talks really give us a slight description of present status where I see things going. Um, a concern in this area, and most of you are familiar with it, I think is probably 90% of what you read in the newspapers or in the professional literature is hype. Probably not realistic. The key information is missing. Now, I've got the latest, safest thing that will charge in five minutes, but give us the data and they won't. So be wary. So let me just, very quick history. On the left hand side here, you'll see the two original examples, the two original batteries that Exxon made in the mid 1970s. A paperweight that still sits on my desk, it's still working today, so that's about 45 years old, which tells you a well made lithium ion battery. I won't say it will last forever, but maybe last that a person's lifetime without any great problems if it's well made. I should say there's probably no batteries that are as well made as that one today because that was welded closed, so there's no chance of any leakage. Beneath that is a battery that powered a motorcycle headlamp on and off for a week at the EV show in 1977. So people think EVs are something new, they're not. That was a huge show in the large convention center in Chicago. Um, that one's about six inches by four inches, so it's not too different to the size of the batteries they put in today's vehicles. Then I show you a series of other um, vehicles there from a little two-seater that my wife and I rented in Bermuda two years ago. 
550th anniversary to a 16 wheeler and a garbage truck that I got to drive around the test track in just north of Seattle in Univ University of Washington. I must say I had a trainer driver next to me to make sure I didn't drive it too fast around the bank curves. But um, he said there's about four tons of stuff, concrete blocks they put in the back of these trucks to stabilize them. And then below that, I put, a, I put a bus there and I'll come back to that bus a little bit later. And we all know about um, solar and wind. So the real driving force, as most people know today, is um, renewable energy. Um, even in the reddest of states like Texas, as I show here, 94% of all the new generating capacity is renewable. That's solar, wind, and storage with a tiny bit of gas and essentially nothing else. Um, obviously that needs storage and in the middle picture there is a Tesla storage facility. I'm not sure whether it's finished construction now, but it's about finished construction in Texas. And it's um, 100 megawatts. We think for four hours, so it's probably a 400 megawatt hour system. And beneath that is the, the large facility in Moss Landing in California. For those of you who don't know California, that's about an hour and a half down the coast um, on the way to Monterey. That started up last December, so it's about a year old, 1.2 gigawatt hours. That's four times larger than the next largest system. They've got the okay to go to six gigawatt hours in the next three to five years. So that tells you how far lithium ion batteries are going. And it's in an ideal situation, because it's at an old gas-fired power plant, so all the utility connections are there already. And we've had no reports of any issues in that particular facility. But let's get into the, a bit of the science, um, a bit of the where we stand now. And I want to really describe um, the Battery 500 project. Um, Huey, who's sat in the back there, will give a, a talk on that later today. But our goal in that program is to double the energy density of today's lithium-ion batteries. And that's run out of Pacific Northwest National Lab. And I show you some of the data we've collected in the first five years. And it doesn't help those of you on both sides. But um, we started in 2017. You can see we've got about 50 cycles at 300 watt hours per kilogram. The commercial cells are about 250 today at the maximum. As of today, we're out about 600 cycles at 350 watt hours per kilogram. I think here we may give you some data at 400, but we're really not supposed to talk about 400 or higher because that's under export control issues. And that's what's happening with the government these days. But um, we can clearly get to 350. I should say we're using a lithium metal anode, not graphite. And we're going back to the old Exxon electrolytes, which are ether-based with various salts in them. So ether-based electrolytes plate out lithium much better. You can see the sort of pouch cells that we use for testing the materials. So the materials are made in one lab, the pouch cells are made out in Washington State, in Pacific Northwest National Lab, then they're tested in Idaho National Lab. There's no, no fudging the data, done in three different places and totally reproducible. So we're very happy that things are working out well. Um, I think you all know that these use meatball morphologies. This is um, a plus and a minus, you get good packing density, but if you overcharge them, these meatballs will crack. When they crack, then you lose capacity, get capacity fading. So we, we're looking at ways of um, solving that. Just in case there's any of you interested, and I'm not going to go into details on this slide, if you want to know how your material would behave in a pouch cell, this little app from Pacific Northwest National Lab, it's not particularly expensive, you can buy it. It will, if you put your data from your small cells into it, it will then tell you what you can expect in a pouch cell. It will also tell you how critical it is to have the absolute minimum amount of electrolyte in there, the minimum amount of anode in there. So you see how critical these parameters are if you want to get really high energy density.
So where and there's exciting area, I showed you the meatballs for a reason, because there's a lot of interest now in saying, we don't want to use these small meatballs anymore. They tend to crack, so this, these are these guys. They're about 200 nanometer primary particles. These are stacked together. When you take the lithium out, they contract, and then the secondary particles crack. Then you get new electrolyte in there, it reacts on the surface and causes it to fade. So if we go back to day one of the batteries at Exxon, we start off with single crystals, and these were larger. I was trying to find out what the scale on this one is, but we think this is um, probably 100 microns and about 10 microns or so thick. So very large single crystals. These, these work best. If you go back to Sony's original data on lithium cobalt oxide, again, they use single crystals. Their single crystals were from 10 to 20 microns in size. Again, for safety, less surface area, less thermal runaway. But then when we wanted better performance, then we went to these meatballs, higher surface area, greater power, faster charging, and but capacity fade. What Jeff Don has now done is make, made some of these same NMC materials in single crystals. This one's 50% um, nickel. Um, Argon's now got up to 80%, and my colleague at Pacific Northwest National Labs about 86%. The big advantage of single crystals, low surface area, less side reactions. In principle, they will last forever. So this is what's now been described as the million mile battery. We're never going to drive a million miles, maybe if you're a taxi driver, but the rest of the vehicle will fall apart before then, I think. But um, the reasons for that, you can then put it on the grid and leave it on the, attached to the grid the entire time you're not actually driving it. So the utility will be able to take power out of it, put power back in. If you have a power failure at your home, it will keep your home going. So that's the, the big interest here. It'll give a more resilient grid, obviously a more resilient home, and it should lower the initial cost of the vehicle because the grid will basically um, help pay for it. So that's where there's a lot of excitement now. There's little interest, I think, in second use of these batteries because most of them are going to last 10 years. By the time you got to 10 years, there's a good chance a new battery will cost less than what you could sell the old one for. But the price is going the way they are. Let me look at the other area where we're doing. We're really trying to push the limits. So in the NMCs, we're trying to get to 90%. Um, nickel, essentially get rid of all the cobalt. That's the real big push. But the other way to... Um, increase the energy density, increase the safety, lower the cost, is to go back to the phosphates. So LFP was the original um, one that A123 developed. It was what was in the um, grid storage facility in Binghamton here for many years. Most of the grid storage has gone to an MC. I'm not sure why, it must be cheaper or something. But there's clearly, it's gonna be an interesting going back to the lithium ion phosphate the challenge is its energy density is about half that of NMC. So it's going to take up twice the space, twice the weight. But we believe you can get around that in one of two ways. One, you can go to manganese, which raises the voltage from three and a half to four volts. That's what um, IM3 New York is doing. And I know there's a lot of those folks here, so you can ask them exactly what they're doing. The other way is to do what we're trying to do, and that is put two lithiums per transition metal into the phosphate. So what we've been doing is looking at um, boundial phosphate, which is this red one in red here. We looked at this originally about 15 years ago. Um, we got pushback from DOE. That vanadium is toxic. You shouldn't really be working on it. Then about four years ago, DOE came back to us and said, why aren't you working on vanadium? Now that, that's how they're, they're going. Vanadium is the fourth most abundant transition metal. If you've, you're near a refinery that's handling heavy crude, they'll give it to you for free. It's what comes out of the porphyrins when they desulfurize heavy crude. So there's, there's lots of it around. And people have looked at putting two lithiums in several of these materials, and I'll show you a few here. The original one was this layered diselenide. 
voltage is too low. Argon, Mike Thackeray looked at the layered oxides, one lithium up here, the other one's all the way down here. So again, not much interest. So we went back and looked at these um, vanadyl phosphates. So it's a V double bond O structure in there. Nice open tunnel structure. And we thought these might, might work. So we spent quite a few years trying to make them. And the way we made these in the end was the same way they make um, all the zeolites, this what we call a hydrothermal process, just dissolve all the reactants up, heat them up to say 200 degrees centigrade for a day or two. Probably only needs an hour or two, but a day or two, no. You put it in on Friday, when you come back on Monday, it's done. So it makes life easy. Um, this is done in chemical plants, hundreds of tons, so it's cheap. The temperature is the waste stream temperature of a refinery or chemical plant, so you're not using any energy. So we made these little cuboids. If you now grind these up with a little bit of graphene, then this is the kind of electrochemistry you get. It's a two-step process, um, about four volts and two and a half volts. It now has a capacity of um, over here, 300 milliamp hours per gram compared with under 200 for an MC, but the voltage is slightly lower. And with the added phosphate group, the energy density here is almost as high as high nickel MC, and it's much safer and it's lower cost. So we're now pursuing a number of still challenges with this material. Vanadyl phosphates are very good oxidizing agents used by the chemical industry to oxidize organics. So it likes our organic solvents, so it will oxidize them. So we're looking for better electrolytes. Just to fin finish off, I want to make a few comments about um, the latest area where there's a huge amount of effort. I expect um, close to probably a billion dollars going into solid state batteries these days. Um, they're touted as being in the end lower cost, um, being safer, no organic liquids in there to burn, um, no graphite in the anode. So a lot of people don't realize a lot, there's a lot of energy when the batteries burn in burning that graphite. Probably half the heat that comes out of those is from the graphite. So I listed a number of companies that are very active. Um, solid power is probably the one that's furthest along. They're using a sulfide based electrolyte. They've made large cells, but they have to do everything in a super dry room because the sulfides are water sensitive. And the concern there is something goes wrong you may get H2S off or you get sulfur dioxide off. So that you'll see on each one of these, there's some concerns. Quantum scape, we don't know what the electrolyte is. It's believed probably to be a ceramic. They've got now multi-layer pouch cells. So they're progressing. Um, all these companies have large investments from the auto industry. So the auto industry is, is backing them. Um, the third area is really Polymeric electrolytes, and this is what um, Blue Solutions is doing. You may know them as Bellore. They're based in um, France. This is based on techno technology funded by um, DOE at 3M and Hydro-Quebec. And it was initially commercialized by um, those folks. And I'll touch on that in a moment. Um, their present systems are commercial. They're in cars, so if you rent these cars by the hour in Indianapolis, Paris, those all have these solid state batteries in them. They also have grid storage. So when people say solid state isn't commercial, that's not right, it is commercial. They operate at 70 degrees centigrade, so you're not gonna see them in your own car. Um, Eric Waxman at University of Maryland is also very hot on using various garnet ceramic electrolytes and there are some advantages of ceramics. Um, they're not gonna burn to begin with. So they're in essence a barrier there. And he's got these to work well with NMC and titanium disulfide. And there's a number of brand new electrolytes coming out of the Linda Nazars group at the University of Waterloo that look very interesting, but I'm not, I've been told I can't talk about them for another few weeks until she's got all her patents filed and things like that, but there's a number of interesting things. Um, there's a number of caveats when you look at 
solid state batteries. Will they operate at room temperature? A lot of them may not. The counter of that is you probably don't need any thermal management. So if you look at today's lithium ion, if it's on the grid, the round trip efficiency is about 70% because 20% is used to control the air conditioning. In those containers, if you look at the raw gut air conditioning units on the top, that takes up 20% of that stored energy. So if you can do away with that thermal management, you'll be much more efficient. Um, a number of them use liquid in the cathode compartment. So if you've got a solid, solid interface, how do you make sure that matches, particularly if they start expanding, which they're going to do as you move lithium. So a number of them are putting a drop of liquid in that compartment. So if somebody, um, say they've got this great new solid state battery, don't ask them, is there any liquid in it? Ask them, how many drops of liquid are you putting in there? Okay, and I think you'll find most of the sulfur ones aren't, but I think everybody else is putting a little bit of liquid in there to grease that interface. Um, and a lot of these systems are using what we call a dual solid electrolyte, one stable to the lithium and one stable to the cathode. So you have a, a double solid electrolyte in there. Let's look at some of the issues. They've been touted as being super safe, but um, we all know that's probably not quite the case. So I show you here, all lithium metal batteries will tend to form dendrites as you charge them. Zinc batteries do the same thing. Anything you, when you plate out metal will tend to form dendrites. So this is some work that Russ Kinelli at Exxon did back in the 70s. Beneath that, I show you some signal boosters of AT&T. These used batteries from Avastor in Canada. These are the original PEO-based batteries. Um, these burnt up within a few months of them being installed. And this was, I'm going to say 30 odd years ago. So this is a long time ago. The Mercedes bus I show you there has an all solid state battery option in it. At the end of September, you can see what happened to one of those, which they believe was caused by a fire in the battery when it's being charged inside the garage. Inside that garage, there are 20 buses burning because of that one that caught fire. So it's a big question mark. Are solid state batteries as safe as people think they are? We know dendrites can grow through grain boundaries. We know in these original batteries here, to to get the power up, they made the electrolyte too thin. Blue Solutions said they made it thicker, but maybe not thick enough. But we don't know really what caused it there. All we know is somebody said they saw the fire on top of the bus to begin with, then the whole facility burnt up. What I'd like to um, briefly mention is um, some of the challenges in front of us and then some of the things we're trying to do here. Um, if any of you are working on alternative battery systems, um, it's my belief these intercalation systems will dominate for the next five or 10 years. The layered oxides are gonna be the ones that dominate amongst those because they're the ones made in the billions. Um, the phosphates are coming back very fast, partly because um, the now lower cost, the price of cobalt is crazy. Um, nickel prices are going up and you probably all saw the announcement that Tesla is now selling their, how do I put it, their regular cars using lithium ion phosphate, not NMC, in the United States. They've been selling them in Germany, made in China for the last year, but they're switching over to lithium ion phosphate because it's lower cost on, on only on their premium cars, but once with the extra fast speed, will they actually keep the NCA? So they're beginning to switch. And I think you'll see other companies slowly switching over because the cost is going to be much lower. In principle, the safety is also better. Um, I've already talked about whether solid state electrolytes are viable. They clearly are working in these buses, but now clearly there are some safety issues there. The real challenge we have today in the present environments, it takes between 60 and 80 kilowatt hours of energy 
to make a one kilowatt hour lithium ion battery. That's from the mine to the final bus or car. Somebody has calculated if you, you get say the cobalt out of the mine, it travels somewhere between 30 and 40,000 miles before it gets into the final vehicle, which is crazy. And that's where a lot of this energy comes from. So we, we really need a regional supply chain. Europe is doing this. Europe, Europe is going to do the mining in Scandinavia, then do the processing in Scandinavia using clean hydropower. In the US, we need to do the same thing. But you'll notice I emphasize a word here. We have to stop being quite as parochial as we are. We have to say North America is doing this because Canada has a lot of lithium. They have large deposits of nickel and they have the only processing capability for cobalt in North America. So we have to work closely with them. No, they're not very far north of us here. I think from here, they're closer than Washington DC is. So we should be able to work with them. We need to get cleaner recycling technologies. And I'm very happy that you know, lithium cyclists building their large facility up in Kodak Park in Rochester. We need that and that's going to really help. And you know, when the Gigafactory gets going here, about 10% of the material will be waste. And that can go straight into a lithium recycling facility. Um, we are proposing a facility called Battery New York to address the above challenges. And I d won't go into this in any detail, except to say we have plenty of activity in this area in the United States. We have equipment manufacturers. We have lots of great universities, great startup companies. Small cells can come up with new chemistries. And hopefully one day we'll have commercial over here. And I think IM3 New York is probably the only remaining American operated gigafactory in the US. All the rest, Tesla's operated by Panasonic, all the rest of South Korean, and maybe in the, in the future, um, China, China. So what we're planning in Battery New York, what we like to do is get totally new technologies for making the batteries. So we're working with applied materials who make the machines. So we don't use the standard roll to roll with all the wastage. And the goal there is to leapfrog Asia and to get IP position so we can lock it up and keep it in the US. And the other goal is to make full size pouch cells. So at Rochester at RIT in our lab, we can talk about making ampere hour power cells. What we want to be able to do is be able to make um, kilowatt hour power cells. So they'll be the same size as you might use in a commercial system. So a company can try out something before they uh, go full hog in it. And we'd interact with um, industry, do the cell testing, and we have great characterization facilities with Brookhaven, Cornell, and so on in the region. So my final slide, what are the options beyond lithium ion? And I said, I don't think you're gonna see much commercial beyond lithium ion for the next five or 10 years. Because the real chance lithium ion now is about hundred dollars a kilowatt hour in large quantities. So anything else coming in has got to get lower than that. So to break into the market, they're going to have to find a niche market where they can actually make money at some higher price. Um, lithium conversion systems are probably the most exciting. And I showed in intercalation reactions, those are the ones we used to say, you're not changing the crystal structure. Lithium conversion, you're destroying the structure and then rebuilding it. And the most exciting of those are, is lithium sulfur will give you by far the highest energy density if you can make it work. I'm not sure there are many companies left in that business. Um, Scion, when they got BASF funding, they quit. The company in Britain that was commercial, they went bankrupt what, six months ago. So all these companies saying, we've got it, we're ready to go. They didn't have it and they weren't ready to go. So we know having worked on it, this half of battery 500 is lithium sulfur. There are a lot of technical challenges there. Um, sodium might have niche markets if lithium gets too expensive, but it will have significantly lower energy density. 
And in my mind, it's going to be significantly less safe. Remember, sodium melts at about 100 degrees centigrade. And it's not too difficult to get to 100. Lithium doesn't melt to 182. So if you get to a temperature where the sodium can melt, you've got an organic solvent, there's something else, you've then got a bomb on your hands. So people are, I think, very concerned about that. The only sodium batteries commercial today are the sodium sulfur, um, which are made in Japan. Um, BASF has just installed one in Germany at one of their facilities. There was one in Long Island at a bus company. It lasted, I think, maybe a year. People may have better numbers. It basically needs a professional to look after it. It operates at 300 degrees centigrade. So it failed after one year and it's never been used again. Um, flow systems, I think, are going to have challenges. We worked on those at Exxon for oh, until about five years ago. They're busy working on those. You've got a lot of corrosion problems. You've got a chemical plant, basically. And so you've got to have people there to maintain it, look after it. Lithium ion, you can just forget about. You know, once it's there, you can sit in your office with your computer and control it. So it's going to be a challenge there, but I think they'll come. Other key areas, clean, green hydrogen. If you're talking about driving trucks across the United States, you're not going to do that with a battery. You could easily think of using hydrogen for fleet vehicles like that or other fleet vehicles where you have a central place to do it. Remember, if you're using hydrogen in a fuel cell, you still need a fairly large battery. The battery will give you the acceleration and give you generative braking. But there are a number of um, companies doing this. I don't see anybody seriously doing personal cars anymore. That seems to have dropped off the radar, even though Toyota was pushing it hard. Um, what we have to remember, the dominant means of storage, for whatever it is, it's still pumped hydro in New York State, Pennsylvania, Tennessee Valley. It's by far the lowest. It's really the only, probably the only viable one for what we call seasonal shifting of energy. And we use much more energy in winter and summer than we do in spring and fall. You're not going to use batteries for that. Um, there's a lot of effort today to increase their efficiency. So they're changing out the turbines for better ones. I think people are looking at, can we make them 10% larger? and looking for a few new sites and there may be smaller sites so i don't think you can see the huge facilities that we presently have and i'll stop there and if there's any time left bill i'll try to answer any questions yes uh, it depends whether you live on a little mountain right <laughs> I, I think you're going to see storage in the buildings. Clearly, New York City has a real challenge because the fire folks control what goes there. Um, if you put storage in the city, it's got to be safe. It's got to be within reach, I understand, of their ladders. So you've got a skyscraper, you can't put it on the roof. It's got to be, is it build the fifth floor? It's about the, as high as you can go. Right. I think, yeah, after the, the hurricane that came through there, remember, the hospitals were down because all their backup systems were in the basement and got flooded. Um, the gas stations had plenty of gas, but no electricity to pump the gas. I think places like that's going to be mandated that they have some, whether it's a local grid within their particular company or in, in the neighborhood. And I think that's where people are looking at now. Do you have one or do you have your housing development have a, a system? But I think it's going to be coming. Yes. Is this on? Yes. Yeah. Okay. The question online, when will curtailed renewable energy be used to create green hydrogen at scale? You will have to ask an expert. Is Paul in the audience here? Paul, you answer that. <laughs> Say that again, Paul. What? 
five years or less, according to Paul Mutolo from Cornell University. <laughs> Yeah, that, uh, figment of somebody's imagination. Anything that has moving parts, you're really going to have problems with maintenance, lifetime costs. There may be small um, scale systems that are commercially viable, but I don't think you can have very large systems. It's the same with pumped air in the ground. No, they did that, it must be 20 years ago now, I kept saying it's going to be more and more. There's still only one in the US and one in Europe. Yeah, I've stayed away from nuclear in this talk. Um, if, um, if the government allows it and the cost comes down, I think that's the way to go. It's obviously clean, carbon, CO2 free. And no, uh, my wife lives in Oswego and there's three nuclear power plants there. And I don't know how many billions of dollars Cuomo gave them. Keep those going for another 10 years. The clean nuclear is clean. They're going to try to keep the present plants going as long as they can. And if you come up with small plants or come up with a um, new fusion technology, that's going to be one way to go. Because there's still an issue with wind and solar. If it gets dark and miserable, how much energy can you really store? So I'm not a believer you can go totally renewable. Let's thank Stan Whittingham again.